welcome back to my channel. My name is Kat and I am a flight attendant for a major US airline. So in today's video, we're kind of going to be covering one of those like hot topics that I get asked about a ton. So many of you have questions about can flight attendants live outside of base? How do they do it? How does commuting work? What is jump seating? All this kind of stuff. We are literally going to be covering everything. We're going to be covering the policy. We're going to be covering priority levels. We're going to be covering pros and cons. We're going to be covering the best flights to take and all this other stuff. Stuff. So I'm going to be covering pretty much the most well-rounded video that I feel like I can possibly create for you. I literally have my computer in front of me just to kind of help me out and take me step by step so I can read you factual information so you can get the best information possible. So you can pretty much make an educated decision for yourself of should you commute or should you go ahead and live in base. So without further ado, let's dive in. We interrupt this program to bring you a special report. Okay, you guys, so I'm actually almost done editing this entire video. I've just got a few more things to do, but I did wanna say this before you get into the video is it's a lot of information. And as I'm editing it, I'm realizing how much information it is, especially new information for most of you. And I spoke pretty quickly through it. So if I'm speaking too fast for you, you can slow down the pace so I'm not talking as fast. I'm really, really sorry. The information is super good, really on point, really factual, but it's a lot of information and it's probably a lot of new information, especially for those of you who are planning to apply. So if you need to, you can slow it down. <laughs> So I think at this point we can all kind of tell that yes, you are allowed to live outside of base. You'll basically become known as a commuter. And so a commuter is somebody who has to commute to work, obviously. So as a commuter, you're basically gonna fall under a commuter policy. Now I hate giving this answer, but it's so true. Each commuter policy is going to be different, varying on the company. I'm gonna go over my company's version of their commuter policy. And I would say it's a pretty good version, if that makes sense. Like I think a lot of airlines are gonna have a very similar version to this, but depending on the airline that you are with, it may change just a little bit here and there. So I literally have my commuter policy right in front of me that I'm going to read to you, but before I do that, I do wanna go ahead and address this. When you are applying to be a flight attendant, there is a 99.9% .9 chance they are going to ask you, are you willing to relocate? Basically, are you willing to live in base? And they are looking for a yes on this answer. Now, are you willing to relocate? I don't really know. I can only tell you they do want a yes because they want somebody who's really flexible. Now, I will say with this job, there's a lot of flexibility, but it also requires a lot of flexibility out of you. So, now a lot of airlines may realize that you may have kids, you may have marriages, you may have already bought a house. I mean, you're living your life and going to apply for this job, but they are looking for somebody who is willing to relocate. So, you should probably put yes on that answer. <laughs> okay, now that that's kind of off my chest, Let's get into the commuter policy. So the commuter policy basically says that you need to give yourself two flights. So you have to have two chances to be able to get to work before your check-in time. Also, when you're planning your two commuter flights, you need to make sure that both of them will give you the opportunity to get there at least an hour prior to your check-in time. If your first flight has a cancellation, if it has an equipment downgrade, or if it has a delay due to maintenance or weather or something like that, then that will basically mean that you need to go ahead and try for your second flight. Now, if your second flight gets delayed due to mechanical reasons or weather, or if it gets canceled, or if it gets downgraded, or any of these same kinds of things, then you're going to be protected because you gave yourself two flights. Now, here are some of the catch 22s to this. It cannot be a connecting flight. So say for instance, I'm trying to get to Dallas up to Charlotte and I wanna connect through New Orleans. If I get stuck in New Orleans, it is my fault, I am not covered under the policy. Because basically, as a commuter, you're going to put in your commuter base. So this is basically the base that you're going to be living at. So that covers you from this base to your actual work base, and that is it. No other airports than those. Now, if both of your flights got delayed or canceled or for whatever reason, and you were unable to commute, you are now covered under the commuter policy. So at this point, you will call crew scheduling and let them know that you are unable to commute, and you will have one week to provide documentation. So basically Basically, that would be like maybe a ticket or something. Basically something to say, I was there, I was trying to commute and I did not get on both of the flights. So you will have to provide documentation for both flights. And at this point, crew scheduling has three options. They can either try and put you back onto your trip at a later point, they can just take you off the sequence altogether, or they can reassign you to something else that you might be able to commute. It's really just gonna kind of depend on operational need and how bad they need flight attendants. Flights being full does not quite cover you on the first flight. So for example, if the first flight was full and I could not get on, and then my second flight had a delay due to maintenance, 
I'm not covered under the commuter policy. But if my first flight was delayed due to maintenance and then the second flight was full and I could not get on, then I am covered under the commuter policy. So this is part of the reason why commuting can be so, so hard. You have to remember, airlines are in the industry of selling seats and they do a terrific job, even to the point that they will oversell flights. So you as a commuter have to beat out some of these people trying to get on these oversold flights. It gets really hard and very stressful very quickly. Okay, now let's talk about priority levels. So basically, again, priority levels are gonna kind of vary from airline to airline. For example, my airline is check-in time based. So for example, when I'm choosing to non-rev, it's going to go in order from check-in time. So you'll basically be able to check in up to 24 hours prior. So the first person to check in is basically gonna be at the top of the list but also we have priority statuses. So basically we'll get six D1. So D1s are the highest priority that you can have. So then you'll have unlimited D2. So D2s is basically your priority. You will fall underneath revenue passengers. So for example, if there was somebody who did not get their flight or they misconnected or for whatever reason, they now have to be on yours and they paid for a ticket, they will go over you no matter what, okay? Now I know there's also some other airlines that don't have a check-in time based system they have a seniority based system. So if I checked in and then somebody senior comes along last minute, they're going to jump me. So it all kind of depends on whatever system that you're working underneath. I personally prefer the 24 hours. I think it gives everybody a fair shot, whether they're junior or senior to me. That's my personal preference. I know some people will completely disagree with me, but I do think that's overall fair. And another thing that I get asked is if I'm traveling just for fun or if I'm commuting, do I have a higher priority as a commuter? And the answer is simply no. So it doesn't matter if somebody's going on vacation or if it's me trying to get to work or at the same level, basically because I chose to commute instead of living into base. There's also something called zetting. And I've talked about zetting before, and that's basically being able to non-rev on another airline. So depending on who your airline has partnerships through, you might be able to do a Z fare, which is like a very, very minimal fee to be able to go take a different airline's plane. The only thing about zetting is you basically lose all of your priority. You're pretty much at the bottom of the list. But even so, sometimes zetting can actually be the better way to go because the flight might be way empty compared to your airline, which is way full. Okay, so the next thing, there is something called jump seating. So jump seating basically allows you to take a jump seat. So that's basically wherever you're gonna see the flight attendant sitting whenever you're taking off and you're landing. There's also um, jump seats up in the flight deck. Now, pilots can only take the jump seat in the flight deck and flight attendants can only take the jump seat in the cabin. So as far as jump seating goes, most of the time when you hear jump seating on another airline, usually that just means taking a normal seat. You cannot actually jump seat on their airline, usually. But when you're jump seating on your own airline, there might be a few extra jump seats depending on the aircraft that's flying and you might actually be able to take one of those. So that way you're not competing with a revenue passenger because obviously a revenue passenger cannot sit on the jump seat. Now in order to sit on the jump seat, you have to be qualified on that plane, which is kind of where this comes into play that even though you're jump seating on another airline, it's actually just non-revving, you can't take their jump seat because you didn't really go through their training and their qualifications on their planes, if that makes sense. You may have gone through your own. So for example, I may be qualified on the 737, but I may not have gone through that company's version of training on their 737s for evacuations and stuff. So overall, it's just a safety measure. Now, if your airline is wholly owned by a bigger airline, so for example, if I'm a regional airline and I'm wholly owned by a mainline airline, I may be able to take their jump seat depending on their policy rules. So that's sometimes why you may see Envoy or PSA or Piedmont or any of these companies actually be able to jump seat on American. But the thing is, an American flight attendant can actually take the jump seat over a regional flight attendant. The other thing about being a regional flight attendant is most regional planes do not have extra jump seats. So if you are a regional flight attendant and you want a jump seat, most of the time, unless you're a wholly owned company, you are not actually ever going to be able to be qualified to take somebody's jump seat. The other thing about jump seating is you can actually be jumped on the jump seat. Now this is kind of a rare circumstance, but it does happen. So for instance, if your flight service manager, so basically that's a, kind of like your in-base manager, it's the person that you report to when something happens or you need to talk to somebody or, or all these little things. Basically it's your manager that actually doesn't manage you on your day-to-day -day work. It's really hard to explain. But anyways, if your flight service manager has flight attendant qualifications and they are on business, they can take that jump seat over you. So a lot of managers actually are flight attendants that come off the line for a bit, but they still qualify every year 
for their flight attendant credentials. And if they're on a business trip and they need the jump seat, you're gonna get jumped. <laughs> okay, you guys, I know this is a lot of information, but bear with me. I hope I'm explaining this the best I possibly can and break it down to the simplest level. But here to me are the best times and the best flights that you can commute for are gonna be called first flight, last flight. So first flight is basically the first flight of the day and last flight is the last flight of the day. So these are gonna be some of the easiest to me because the first flight out of the day, a lot of people seem to miss that flight, and the last flight of the day, a lot of people have already been misconnected or missed flights and been rerouted and stuff. So it seems to me that those two flights are the best ones to get on. I would personally tell you because I do have some commuting experience, I have been a commuter before, but I was a commuter with a crash pad, which is a little bit different but it is much easier to commute out the night before or the day prior. It sucks because you basically lose one of your days off, but that's part of commuting. But it is so much less stress to try and commute out the day before than it is the day of because you are going to be sweating bullets. Non-revving is like fun when you get on and it's kind of like a rush, but it is so incredibly stressful. You have to basically think of commuting as a job to your job. You're gonna be tracking all sorts of flights. You're gonna be tracking times. You're gonna be tracking loads. You're gonna be tracking weather. You're gonna be tracking lots and lots of stuff. And it gets very stressful very quickly. But you also have to think of the time that you're gonna be spending commuting on flights on top of the time that you're already going to be working. So that stuff adds up really quickly. I think your entire quality of life changes when you choose to become a commuter. Now the next thing, is if you're on probation. So usually probation is going to be the first three months, maybe the first six months, maybe the first year, depending on your airline. You do not want to be caught with a no commute. This is a terrible offense. I know for us, we have two paths. We have like an attendance policy path and a performance policy path. And commuting basically takes you on the wrong end of both paths. It's a double offense when you are on probation, which sucks. Now, if you're covered under the commuter policy, that's not the same thing. This is basically saying if you were not covered. So maybe you were already on your fourth strike with the commuter policy, so now it's counting against you. Or maybe you didn't give yourself the two flights, or maybe the load got full last minute. I mean, lots of things can go terribly, terribly, terribly wrong. <laughs> kind of backtrack a little bit because I did say that I used to be a commuter with a crash pad. So this is kind of where that comes into play. So a lot of times you'll have about three options you can do. The first option being is you can commute to base and have a crash pad to stay in. Now there's hot beds, there's cold beds. I have an entire video on crash pads if you want to know more about the lifestyle behind a crash pad. Your second option is you can basically do a hotel. So a lot of times we'll have hotel discounts and offer rates, especially for commuters in base. So depending on the city that you're commuting to, some of those hotels for commuters are even cheaper than other hotels in another city. So for example, if I was commuting to Charlotte, that commuter hotel is gonna be much cheaper a night versus maybe the LA or the New York commuter hotel. And the third option, which I think is a terrible option, but it is an option, is sometimes you can sleep in the crew room. Now I think it's a terrible option because not all crew rooms have showers. In fact, most of them don't. There's very minimal privacy. You're basically sleeping in a recliner and it's, it's not a good look. It's really not a good look. <laughs> but if you need to and you're stuck in a bind, maybe financially for whatever reason, you can definitely do that. Okay, so finally, should you commute? It's really up to you, but you do have to think of it as a second job. And come October to November, guess who's gonna be a commuter again? This girl, I did not get my transfer request so far, so I will definitely be commuting. It's not fun, I'm not looking forward to it. I would avoid it at all costs if possible, but it is doable. I will say the more seniority you get, the easier it will become because then you can bid for commuter flights and you're not on reserve, which reserve and commuting is oh, it's awful. It's awful because you basically have to stay in base for all the days you're available instead of just being able to go home and come back and going home and coming back. But when you have some seniority, it is very doable. I know because then you can just fly in for your trips, go work your trips that you made commutable and then come right back home. So my personal recommendation is to at least live in base or have a place in base like a crash pad or something until you are off probation and you kind of get the hang of things. But at the end of the day, you're gonna be able to do what you wanna do. So definitely take all this information and really think and really consider what is going to be best for you. I hope you enjoyed this. Please give this a thumbs up if it was very informative and subscribe down to my channel if you have not already. Thank you so much for joining me and I hope you have a great one. Bye.